Okay, so we've so we're live. Brilliant. So good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to the University of Lincoln, and thanks for joining us this morning. Um, I'm Ian Scowan. I'm the head of the School of Chemistry here. Uh, and uh, over the next 30 minutes or so, we'll be introducing programs in the School of Chemistry, addressing particularly our two undergraduate uh, areas of chemistry itself and, and forensic science. I'm sure you'll be able to see that we've got a broad portfolio of opportunity and I hope we'll, we'll be able to find an ideal fit for your future ambitions through that. I'm joined by two senior colleagues in the school, by Tasnim and by Hilary, um, and we'll be talking through the aspects of the programmes uh, in due course. Of course, today is all about you getting as much information as you want and as you need. Um, so following this session, uh, I'd strongly encourage you to join Tasnim and Hillary on the Unibuddies portal. Um, the link, I think, is, uh, is available to you um, in the comments line. Um, and it'll be an ideal opportunity for you to talk individually about your own circumstances. As we go through, please, if you've got any thoughts or uh, um, questions, do post them up into the chat. And I'll do my best to keep an eye on that. And hopefully we can finish uh, uh, a few minutes early uh, around our conversation and, and then address some of those. So with without further ado, colleagues, if you don't mind to introduce yourself, Tasnim. Yeah. So I'm Tasnim. I'm the program leader for the chemistry courses. And um, in terms of research, I'm an inorganic chemist interested in functional materials, particularly developing catalysts for green chemistry processes. Um, and one of my roles in, in this school is um, our leader on the school's admissions processes for all of our undergraduate programs. So I, I will look after you through the whole admissions process in the school for all the different programs. I'm Hilary, I'm the Director of Teaching and Learning for the school and I teach on the forensic science and forensic chemistry programs. I'm a practicing forensic toxicologist, so I'm interested in drugs and alcohol. And I've got professional experience as an expert witness. I also work with the government as an advisor on the uh, Drug Misuse Committee. And I'm particularly interested in new psychoactive substances and how they affect our society. We're all, we're all interested in drugs and alcohol, Billy. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So thank you both. Um, I, I, you know, I think we're, these are really exciting times here at Lincoln with both our key areas. We've created in recent times a pretty distinctive and what we like to think is very innovative curricula uh, that provides students with, with, with many, many opportunities to find their own pathway uh, through their subject areas uh, towards future careers. Our programmes do enjoy you know, a very strong national profile, international profile, and we'll be talking through one or two aspects around the strong rankings and league tables, et cetera, that we've been, uh, been able to acquire in recent times. Importantly, of course, we've seen in recent times uh, outstanding successes for our graduates. And as I think um, you'll hear as you go through, also some really strong uh, and satisfying experiences for our students as they study here at Lincoln. Um, the university itself, um, I'm sure you'll hear many aspects about this with some of the other sessions here, but uh, it's a modern campus, we're located in the city, and actually represents a really strong regeneration story for the, for the city itself, following the university's establishment in the mid 90s. Um, Lincoln itself, I think we all find is a very attractive place to work uh, and our students do talk of, uh, of it being an attractive place to study, has a very rich, rich history. Um, our VC Mary Stewart talks about it being one of the great small cities in the UK and I think that's actually certainly the case. Um, all the facilities that you'll engage with, your lectures, your labs etc are all close by on campus uh, and walkable from student accommodation as well. So that will be helping your green footprint and, and also your, your um, step count and your Fitbit. If you wear one of those. The school itself, we, we opened here in 2014, um, uh, enjoyed some significant national funding to establish chemistry here at uh, Lincoln. Uh, and we've been able to create um, a, a very strong, and exciting environment uh, supported with extensive facilities. I think from my point of view, crucially, the developments and the successes we recently have uh, uh, have been based really with, with, with full participation with our students. They're central to our continuing 
development as a school, uh, and they play a central role in, in determining our strategic direction. So let's talk a little bit more, um, colleagues, uh, uh, around what students might expect from studying uh, in the school's programs, uh, and specifically what it's like for them to study here at Lincoln. Tasman, Hillary, what are your thoughts? Yes, uh, I'll start off. So um, student experience is really important to us um, at Lincoln, and that students have a really supportive learning environment and an atmosphere here at, um, in the School of Chemistry. And importantly, we try and make that transition from school to university much easier. So and we have a number of mechanisms to do that. We've, um, as, as Ian said earlier, we've got a really innovative curriculum, um, which is informed by um, industry. We have professional practitioners who come and teach our students on a number of different modules. And they equip our students with um, key skills which are needed for future employment. We also place a really big emphasis on developing important skills that you need in future for employment. Um, for example, teamwork, and especially in the early years, um, the formation of study groups. You know, we want to, you to develop that study group with other PM, with other students, um, and we encourage you to um, to do this through collaborative exercises throughout each of the programs and. And more importantly, this also helps you to make friends on the course and, you know, uh, and work with each other. Um, we're strongly committed to the development of students as individuals, and we work with the individual on a number of different things, um, especially around employability, what do you want to do in terms of a career, um, and, and help you make those um, and pursue those opportunities that will support your future career development. So we've also got a really strong commitment to quality, diversity and inclusion. And if you come and see us in the school, and we really hope you will be able to come and see us, you'll see our lovely shiny new award that we've got um, for equality and diversity. We've got a, a plan in place as part of that. And the students are a very, a really important part of that team. And that equality, and diversity and inclusion team, uh, I'm the deputy chair of. We've also got a really strong um, international set of staff um, and not only can they help to put all the science into context, uh, but they also can provide you with opportunities in the future if you think about perhaps going studying overseas or working overseas. Um, and this year we've seen really strong rankings for our subject strands. So, so chemistry this year in the Guardian League tables is number three. Um, but more importantly for um, student experience, teaching quality, and I think the most probably the most important thing, graduate employment, we're number one in the term, Times Good University Guide. We've also been in the top 10 for overall satisfaction, so that's student experience um, in all different categories, um, and a number one in 2017-18 and 2018-2019. So more generally, um, the university has just been named as uh, Modern University of the Year uh, by the Times and Sunday Times, uh, and as a university in the last uh, Teaching Excellence Framework, we were awarded a uh, gold standard placing us in the top 20% of institutions in the country. And for our forensic science, we also consistently rank strongly for graduate prospects. So that's what you're going to go on and do when you finish studying. So we're currently in the top five in the Complete University Guide and the Times University Guide for uh, forensic and archaeological sciences. And then in terms of our facilities, um, so I'm in the chemistry lab. So as you can see behind me, I'm in um, our teaching facilities that where you know our students spend a lot of our, their time. Um, and we've invested quite heavily. So we've got modern teaching and training environments based on major investment in facilities. And more importantly, our undergraduate students routinely use all of our research facilities. For example, the NMR will be used by students. You know, they'll have hands-on access with uh, data analysis, with running their own samples, and they're all integrated into the undergraduate pro programs. And that's really important to build up their CVs for future employment. So I'm here in the crime house. We've got uh, a crime house on campus. Um, and if you do one of our forensic programs, you'll be in here uh, with our teacher practitioner learning all about crime scene investigation. We've also got uh, an out, a couple of outdoor crime scenes that we get you to do, but we'll start you off here in level one uh, and build up your confidence with those crime scene skills. So um, I'm in the X-ray facilities here as part of our um, research uh, instrumentation labs. and. Uh, um, and importantly, you know, that research uh, agenda feeds very strongly into our programs. We have key thematics um, uh, around uh, advanced functioning materials, 
science at the chem biology interface uh, and also the development of innovative analytical modeling methods and all of those feed through into the undergraduate programs uh, and importantly focus minds not only on the, how we uh, address the fundamental developments in our subject but also how they apply in different industry sectors um, and those can be as diverse as energy uh, electronics and devices, pharmaceutical uh, arena, and obviously security and forensics in this space. Now, extensive collaborations with industry help us uh, exemplify that. So, lots of opportunities around colleagues. Um, how do these uh, translate to sort of future career options? Uh, and what aspects might students uh, achieve from, uh, from studying here in the school? So as we mentioned earlier, our graduate prospects are extremely strong. Um, and this year, a number of our students have gone on to major graduate schemes with major employers. So this year, we've got people at like AstraZeneca, Pfizer, GSK, RB, Django Land Rover, DSTL, Atomic Weapons Establishment, LG Forensics, amongst many others. Um, that, and that's just naming a few. And so with, with our forensic graduates, we have, have many graduates who go into lab jobs or perhaps work with the police. Um, but because we've got a really strong focus here on professional practice, and we'll talk more about that in a minute, um, and also the importance of quality in forensic science, we do have some of our graduates who perhaps don't want to work in the lab, but can still make a really valuable contribution to forensic science. So we've got someone who works for the forensic science regulator, for example, uh, and someone else who works with the um, Criminal Cases Review Commission. And obviously not everyone wants to go in straight into a job um, and a lot of our students, I think this year 25% of our master's students went on to um, academic careers, for example, postgraduates, particularly PhD with uh, major UK and international universities. I think in general from all of our degree programs, we, um, we teach you the fundamentals of the science and then how that is applied in a professional context. And now professional context is so important um, for our forensic programs. So not only do we have our specialist academics who uh, run the teaching, we also have our professional practitioners. And one who will be working in here in the crime scene house, if you choose to come here, um, is Beth. And she is our teacher practitioner. She works uh, part-time for West Yorkshire Police as a crime scene manager. And the rest of the time, uh, she comes here to teach our students crime scene skills. And she's got some really good stories from her, the other part of her job. Um, but she also um, is really up to date with what's happening in forensic science. And that's so important for you um, when you're setting out in the field. And, and even in chemistry, we have, a, as I said earlier, we have a professional practice plan that runs throughout our chemistry programs, where we expose our students at each level um, with working with different industry professionals from lots of different sectors. They also set industry challenges um, for the students to collaborate in problem solving. And again, this, this is really important. You know, students will be working directly with um, companies and problem solving with um, areas where students um, encounter in, in, in the workplace. That obviously translates into opportunities with graduate employment, as you've mentioned, and also placement opportunities moving forward with, um, with our MCAM program. So maybe let's um, look a little bit at the uh, specifics on the programs. Perhaps, Tasnim, you could, you could um, start off with talking around our chemistry portfolio of programs and how we. Yeah, of course. Um, so our chemistry programs include chemistry and the BSc and the MChem variant, but also the joint programs which focus on specific career destinations. For example, forensic chemistry, chemistry for drug discovery and development, chemistry for education, um, chemistry with maths. Um, and these provide um, students with specific professional training, which is developing collaboration with our partner schools here at the university but also allow people to focus in the application of chemistry to these different areas. Um, for example, our forensic chemistry program, which is very popular, allows um, uh, offers all the professional practice in crime scene science alongside our forensic science program, but builds on chemistry as its academic discipline. And then, um, for example, a lot of students will choose chemistry because they don't know which area of a career that they want to go to. But the chemistry program at Lincoln offers a lot of flexibility and it allows students to explore different areas where their chemistry for, for can be developed. And it's based on four different strands, for example, core chemistry, extension chemistry, practical chemistry, and as I said earlier, the professional practice. 
Um, the professional practice allows students to explore different career options, analytical, formulation, pharmaceutical, and a big area at, this, um, at the moment is the energy environment sector, particularly green chemistry. Um, so, for example, if students choose to do one of the specialist programs, um, the extension and professional practice is replaced by the more um, specialist strands towards forensic science, education, pharmacy, maths and physics. And the theme courses are particularly suitable for students who have a clear idea of what they want to go and do in the future. But again, it also allows flexibility and a, a number of students, you know, when you're 18 or, you know, when you're just starting on a chemistry career, you're not actually sure which area you want to go into. But it allows you to swap if you, you know, if you feel like actually I really like this particular area, it allows you that flexibility. And I think that's really important uh, for students to be able to do. Um, and then our MCHEM year, so a lot of our students will choose um, a four-year degree program, um, but you can swap. Um, it doesn't, it, you know, again, very a lot of flexibility. Um, it's pretty unique. So our placement year is actually in the fourth year of the of the degree program, and our students can choose to go into industry with or, or an international um, placement or a research um, placement within one of our academic research groups. And our students have gone on to a number of different. Um, placement providers from major international companies. Um, we're also, in terms of international partners, we have international partners in Japan, China, America, Australia, etc. And then again, we offer considerable flexibility in which pathway you might wish to follow. And importantly, these decisions don't have to be made now. We'd like to work with you individually and, and find a placement that works for you. Um, our programs, all of our chemistry programs are accredited by the Royal Society of Chemistry. And one of the nice things that they, that, you know, they said about our programs was our different innovative approaches that we, that we have. So they really like the way we teach chemistry. So we teach it in an integrated module approach. They thought that was to be commended. The professional practice modules are especially good in terms of employment. And they really like the excellent infrastructure in our facilities we support students throughout their, their programs. But obviously, very importantly, they also, and we were really delighted by this, um, that they said that they felt that students felt really engaged with the school and the program. So they met with a number of our students. And we had a good reflection on the external examiner's comments, and we had a real respect for the student voice. Thanks, Les. I mean, I, th I think uh, another key feature of the chemistry programs is, is we have the opportunity we with the, with the intake sizes that we have, we can work with people in in smaller groups uh, and get them more engaged in, in learning and support them as individuals with with that. Uh, and those smaller groups obviously then allow us to access the instrumentation much much more regularly. Uh, and so those form a routine part of the student experience throughout throughout the program. Okay, so so just onto our forensic science pro focused programs, Hilary. I think you're, you're probably best place to talk. About through these? Yeah, so for our forensic science program, um, the, the core of it is bioscience, and you do quite a bit of um, bioscience, particularly in the first year, to get everyone up to speed. And then in the following years, you'll be looking at how those concepts can be applied uh, in different types of crimes and different scenes and so on. Um, as Tasman said before, the forensic chemistry program has chemistry really at its core. And if you're thinking, which one's right for me? Should I do forensic science or, or forensic chemistry? We'd love to have you on either program, but please come to UniBuddy and talk to us about it. Um, and we can help you uh, with the, the right decision for you um, and your situation. As, uh, as Tasnam said, if you do choose to do forensic chemistry, you get to do all the crime team things as well. So you'd be in this lovely crime house um, learning the basics of CSI along with the, the forensic science students. And also you'd get to do the professional practice um, from the forensic science program. So we've also got a strong research base uh, when it comes to forensic science, and we like to build on that in the program. So that in terms of projects and, and getting students involved in research, because we don't just want to teach you to be the practitioners of, of the future. We also want uh, people who are going to change the field for the better and come up with new ways of doing things um, and new approaches. We've also got a four strand uh, program structure. So apart from the bioscience and the professional practice, which we mentioned already, there's the crime scene work, and then there's the analytical side. And the analytical side is, is uh, things like toxicology, my field, things like drugs, uh, fires and explosives, that kind of thing. Uh, but that professional practice side is really something that's unique about uh, the University of Lincoln and about our programme. 
No, we're all co accredited. Our program is accredited by the Charter Society of Forensic Sciences, which is the main professional body for working forensic scientists uh, here in the UK. And they were really positive about our program, so they commended us for the, the way the curriculum is designed. They also commended us for having that practitioner input um, and they really like the support that we give to students. So that one-to-one -one support um, that you can access if you're here. We've already talked about Beth, our teacher practitioner. Um, we also have lots of other practitioners who come in um, and teach on our modules. So people will come in and, and talk to you about fire science, about DNA, quality, um, and then that all important presenting um, of evidence in court at the end of the case. Now we've talked about our international staff and uh, we've also got um, international field trips and um, that we run. Obviously that depends on the government guidance at the time, but we've got three field trips that we offer. So the first one um, is at Texas A&M University in the US and that's based on entomology. So that's bugs and how bugs can help us to solve crimes. We've got one in Guatemala, um, and that's really based around human remains and um, forensic anthropology. And then the, the trip that I went on last year is to New York, um, and that focus is, is forensic toxicology um, and specifically the opioid crisis um, in the US. So these are not only a really good chance to kind of see some of the world, and we usually run them between the second and third year, so it's the summer of that second year. But they also give you just a bit more insight into these really specialist areas and um, in thinking about what you might want to do uh, in the future and also shows you that forensic science is, is done differently in different parts of the world so we don't all do it in the same way. Now if you're not keen on going overseas or you can't and um, there is a parallel UK module that you can do instead um, and that's a, a really interesting creative module that gives you a chance to look much more at uh, the way that pu the public understand forensic science. Okay, so lots and lots of opportunity. I often say, you know, as a, as a school, it's our job really to create the opportunities for our students and then to support and encourage them to, uh, to take up those opportunities to find their pathway that works. Okay, so um, rolling back a bit from there, um, most of the people obviously joining us on the chat will be thinking about how to make the transition from A-levels to degree. Um, both of you have lots of experience in supporting the students in making this transition. So briefly, what are your thoughts in, in, in that area? Yeah, um, so it, we think it's really important to support you through that process. It's not always an easy step going from um, school to university. And at, here at, in the School of Chemistry, we want to make that as smooth as possible. So um, in terms of labs, um, so we want to build your confidence in the laboratory and with instrumentation. And we've got lots of support here. Uh, you know, we've got students who can help, we've got PhD students, et cetera. Um, and then in terms of, um, you know, the learning teaching material, we, we revisit some of the key topics in, in the context of the university level module. So you'll, have, you'll see some of the things that you've done at A level and that'll be a more advanced um, in the university, but we'll support you through that process. We offer you a lot of individual support through personal tutoring and academic drop-in sessions. So on a Monday, every Monday, we have a two-hour drop-in sessions where students you know, come with their coursework or something that they've done and get that feedback. We we'll also meet with them academics on an individual basis of around pastoral support. Or, you know, if they're just struggling with university, we think that's you know, that individual support and having being able to come and talk to us is really important. Um, we provide you with all the textbooks that you need in chemistry and in forensic science. We provide you with the learning packs, um, things like lab books, etc. You know, and lab um, lab coats. We give you all of that. Um, and I, as I said earlier, a really good way of making friends is to develop study groups. So, in one of my first year modules, um, we formed those study groups um, where you got to work closely together. But I met with them last week, and it was uh, they really liked it, and it was really important that you know they started to make friends with each other so I, it was a, a really nice way for them to get to know each other as well so right from level one we'll be focusing on uh, learning skills for university to get you through the program we do this through our professional practice module um, and that includes a bit of reflection for you on what's um, the best way of learning for you and your preferred learning style and how you can turn that into um, effective study in the future 
And then in forensic science, um, we've got lots of experience of um, supporting students from diverse backgrounds. So we don't just have students coming from college or school. We have mature students, students who come from the workplace, um, and we really value that diversity. And we recognise that it it builds strength for everybody in the program. And and as I said, um, we really want um, students to work with each other, and we really encourage that peer support. For example, those with confidence in maths can support those with greater experience in biosciences and vice versa. And our maths provision in chemistry at level one, you know, we understand that students come with different backgrounds. Some people have done a GCSE math, some people might have done A-level maths. And we tailor that so we tailor it to individual background and the development act activities are set accordingly. And I think, you know, we do see students supporting one another with, with their different A-level backgrounds. That's one of the really encouraging things. So, you know, the maths, uh, people with maths, further maths, A-level students who've got real confidence in that support uh, people who have less confidence uh, and maybe vice versa in, in those areas. So um, so I think that's all, all, all very good. One thing, we're, we're going to talk about the upcoming admission cycle. Um, Taslim leads our effort in this sort of area. So just strongly encourage you to reach out and make contact, particularly when you know we can consider your individual circumstances Maybe about the, um, the, the post-16 qualifications you're taking, BTECs versus A-levels, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, Tazan, do you want to just talk us through that, that whole process and how we support people through the admissions? Uh, yeah, of course. Um, so, uh, I've been doing admissions for a number of years, and I'm really keen to support you. I guess we all are super keen to support you throughout the next year. You know, it can be really confusing, lots of courses, and Hillary said forensic science, forensic chemistry, which one, MCHEM, BSc. Um, and we want to be really proactive in exploring all the different options to you. So, you know, please feel free to email me. I'm really happy to look through personal statements, etc. And the admissions journey has a number of key steps. And, and all the COVID-19 has required us to adapt these, adapt these in the current circumstances. We aim to offer you as much support or even more support than the usual cycle. So as I said earlier, email me about personal statements. I'm happy to read through them, give you some feedback, course options. Um, and I, I think my email is in the comment section as well, but I'll, I'll be in on Unibody as well. So please do come and join us on Unibody. It's a it's the way that we can give you some advice about your individual situation. Um, and as Tasman said, if you're not sure which programs work for you, um, which whether you want to do um, chemistry, BSc, forensic science or forensic chemistry, we can help you um, with that decision. Brilliant. Um, I just noticed the, the, the uh, messages in the chat have, uh, have come through with the School of Computer Science uh, uh, header on them. Rest assured, they are School of Chemistry, unless they've done something that I don't know about. But, uh, um, uh, yeah, but please do, you know, link, uh, reach out to us uh, with all those mechanisms uh, that, that are in the chat. Um, all our programs uh, do have a a foundation year uh, option and we can use that through the UCAS cycle to provide alternative offers sometimes to people. Um, but Hilary, you've got some experience uh, of linking the foundation years as preparation for the next stages. Just briefly, do you want to just mention how they operate? Yeah, so um, the foundation year modules are taught on campus. Um, people come and, and live in student accommodations just like being uh, a student in one of the other years. Um, so the, the main purpose of them is to kind of consolidate and extend um, the learning that you've done post-16 and also give you an opportunity to try and broaden your experience a bit in things like maths and biology. But it's all very much um, in line with the school. So I'm the link tutor um, for the School of Chemistry. So um, and I run a module um, in the second semester for the fan, for, for the foundation year programme. So you very much will be um, part of the school. Um, and this year we've got a new mentoring scheme where we ask students who've, who've been through the foundation year and are now on the chemistry or forensic science programme to mentor new students uh, coming in. And, and, and I think that's a really an example of how you know, students have, uh, have really helped us develop our ideas here, that we, the idea of mentoring across to our, uh, our students in the foundation year was was initiated by uh, our school rep Gabriella, and um, uh, and uh, that conversation has really helped us sort of link the uh, the communities very well in that sort of space. Okay, and talking of communities, right? Not all hope, not all work um, here at the university. We do love a party in the school of chemistry. Um, do you want to talk a little bit around um, some of the social side in the school? 
um, some of the things we get up to. Um, so we've got a couple of really active student societies. So, so they're societies that, that students run for you. Um, so we've got a forensic science society and a chemistry society, and they're, they're really good organising events. They, uh, For example, they did a quiz um, this year in Freshers' Week just to help um, the new students get to know each other. Um, yeah, and as Hilary said, um, our students like a party, but so do our staff. Um, so social gatherings are really important to us. And at the end of the year, normally we usually have a ball to celebrate, uh, you know, finishing the year. Our students are also really good, actually, at supporting each other throughout the year. Um, and even with COVID and all the changes that that's brought, they've been great with, um, you know, keeping in touch with each other on WhatsApp and, and Facebook groups and using remote learning uh, to get to know each other, even if they can't necessarily see each other face to face. And, and normally it's any excuse um, for a party. So we have a number of international staff and students. So we celebrate all the different festivals. Um, and last year, Ian cooked a big turkey, um, which was very nice. And I think it was, yeah, it was a good party. Yeah. And we also had a, a Thanksgiving a celebration of Bring a Dish Thanksgiving uh, to celebrate with some of our international students from the US. Um, and one of our staff members, Andrea, who's from Italy, brought this amazing tiramisu along, which is still the, the talk of the school. Um, normally during Welcome Week, we'd also our students would also run a tour for you of the city just to help you get your bearings. Um, and that's normally run by students in higher years, so you can get a chance to meet students um, in other levels at the school. Um, I think importantly, we really want to create that supporting learning community. That's really important to us. Um, the student experience is really important and that students feel comfortable. And if they're happy, they'll thrive in both their studies and their future. Perfect. Yeah, we should, uh, should wish everybody a happy Diwali today, of course. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, in the lockdown, we won't be able to have one of our evening get-togethers around that. But, um, uh, but yes... Uh, um, Everybody who's joined us today, happy Diwali, and uh, uh, I, hope, I hope the fireworks uh, uh, go quite nicely this, this evening. Um, Jack Stoney's uh, popped a little question in the chat. Thanks, Jack. Um, uh, we can pick that up. So how many places do we have on the chemistry program, and how many students deferred from this year's academic year? Well, I can talk generally around the sort of um, uh, the numbers of students um, that we routinely take. So we routinely take between sort of 80 and, uh, and 90 students. So quite a uh, quite a compact year group um, that allows us uh, to get people, get around people and work with them in the labs, et cetera. Um, so, but, um, and so typically we'll be recruiting to that sort of number. Tazim, any, any specifics? I don't think there was particular impact about deferred places. We had a few students defer for an, a variety of reasons, and it wasn't because we asked them to defer, you know, because we didn't have the place. Um, it's really important for us that if you do apply, you know, we, you know, and you meet our entry requirements, etc., we, you know, you you are guaranteed a place. Um, and remember, there's again lots of different types of degree programs, so we offer, offer a lot of the different strands, forensic chemistry. But yeah, Jack, if you've got any particular concerns, you know, feel free to. Come on to Unibody, or, or we can have a chat over the phone or by email. Okay, perfect. Um, yes, I mean just to just to re-emphasize that whole piece around. Do reach out, link directly with Tasnim uh, through her personal email. There, um, we think that's a bit better than the sort of general chemistry admissions email. Um, yeah, and as, as I said, a response, right? so. yeah, and as I said earlier, you know, if you just want some help around a personal thing, please feel free to send it to me. I can give you some comments, and I always say that you don't have to apply to LinkedIn. It'd be lovely if you did, but you know, it's, we really want to help you support you through that process. Absolutely, and 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 obviously with with the myriad of different courses that we have, uh, and you know, MChem versus BSc, do do join. Taz and Hillary on um, uh, on uni buddies uh, just now, but I think importantly, don't worry too much. If you apply for one of those programs, we've got lots of opportunities to move you around through the admission cycle, uh, and m many of them will have flexibility as we go through the program. I mean, we've had people transferring uh, degree pathways in the chemistry strand for you know all the way up to the end of the second year, uh, and certainly. To the end of the third year, deciding whether you're going to continue with the MCHEM or you'd like to exit with the BSc um, is, is entirely doable. Most of our students, with the benefit of that placement, 
year that MCAM year do actually stay with us uh, through the full four years of study. Um, also, just to say, if you if you're thinking you might be interested in forensic science or, or work in forensic science in the future. Um, you don't have to do a forensic science degree. So I did chemistry for my degree. So again, doing doing chemistry definitely will leave that option open for you in the future. So don't feel that you have to choose forensic or a forensic program right now. Absolutely, and you know, but we do have pathways towards the higher levels in in those areas. Many of our students progress on to our MSc programs in forensic toxicology and forensic science as a you know a professional pathway in forensic science itself as well so yeah we in conclusion i think you know for us it's it's around how this experience works for you as a as a student how we can sort of help you decide on your future career offer you the flexibility to move around um uh, as you discover more things about your subject uh, and hopefully find this a really exciting place to to live and work and um and from our point of view you know we'd love to work with you into the future so i'll just uh, conclude now um if anybody's got any comments they want to pop them in the chat we can pick those up uh, uh directly through the uni buddies or go back directly with you you will have some contacts and this ses session has been uh, has been recorded um so if you want to hear my voice ad nauseum you're welcome to do so um but uh Hopefully it's been a, a helpful and uh, uh, an informative session. So thank you for joining us. Thank you to both my colleagues for, uh, for their contributions today. And um, it's good to see the university because with a little bit of a lockdown, you know, it's pretty unusual to be in these sorts of working spaces all the time. So good to see you folks. Take care.
Hi, welcome to the virtual open day. Um, and specifically, welcome to the School of Computer Science. Uh, my name is Chris Headland, and I'm the school's director of teaching and learning. I'm joined with two of my colleagues today. Uh, first, Horia, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Hi, hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us. So, uh, yeah, uh, I'm uh, one of the lecturers in the School of Computer Science uh, and also a researcher in the INT lab, so our interaction and human computer interaction lab. Thanks, Chris. And just below me, we have Danny, one of our students. Hi, I'm a current PhD student at Lincoln. Um, I work with Chris on a lot of things. I am also in the INT lab research group. So thanks, Chris. <laughs> So firstly, we would love to, um, we'd lo really like to welcome you to the School of Computer Science. Now, obviously this is somewhat different to the way that we would normally do an open day. And in normal circumstances, we would absolutely love to have you on the campus, show you around our fantastic facilities. And, and Lincoln, Lincoln is an absolutely beautiful city. Um, but given the current national lockdown and the, the current situation, the pandemic, we as a university, we're doing everything we can to support social distancing. Uh, which is why we're putting on these virtual open days. Um, but in addition to the virtual open days, I really want to flag up the fact that we have loads of content on our YouTube site, which has all been made by students. Uh, we have videos about each one of our courses and um, different aspects of university of life as well. So if you have the chance, please go away, have a look at some of that content. Um, so I'd like to start these talks out by saying what makes Lincoln different. Um, and what makes the School of Computer Science at Lincoln a rather unique place. Uh, and I'm going to pass over to my colleagues in a second to get their opinions. But in my position, I think it's the way that we work with our students and the community that we have at Lincoln. We are all colleagues working together. We like to look at ourselves as a whole bunch of people who are really interested in technology and computing and people who want to make the world better with that technology. We get together with our students. We have students involved at every single level of um, leadership, and we really listen to their voice. I'm, for a good example, um, we have students involved in our interviews. Both me and Horia, when we got our jobs at Lincoln, were interviewed by students. Um, and I think that community, that sense of community, is just it's just something that makes Lincoln a really fantastic, unique place. And during the current kind of situation that we find ourselves, that community has been something that we found really, really valuable. Um, Horia, what's what's your opinion? What makes Lincoln different? Yeah, I mean, I really like what you said there, Chris. Uh, you know, a lot of student-led projects, student-led activities, and even student-led interviews. Uh, uh, I, I really like um, the particular connection uh, we do here with research. So all our teaching is, is research led. We try and uh, involve our students in, in all sorts of research uh, projects or so cutting edge research going on uh, now at Lincoln. Um, we, we, we have a cross collaboration between different research groups uh, here. So I really like, uh, I, I would really like to, to talk more about how we, we do this. Um, we, we have small, um, research communities for our undergraduate, postgraduate and staff. Uh, we share ideas, we share uh, research papers that we perhaps read, uh, etc. So, so yeah, uh, thanks, Chris. I really think uh, one of the unique uh, elements at Lincoln is, is this super uh, research informed teaching and involving our research, uh, our students in research uh, as early as possible. And it's worth saying, actually, one of the foundational principles of the University of Lincoln is this idea of student as producer. Um, we, we don't like treating our students as just consumers of knowledge. We like getting our students to produce knowledge and to put knowledge back into the world. Um, we have a whole bunch of, like say, Horia said, student-led research projects, um, and we fund those as well. We have uh, a number of funded research opportunities that students can work on through the summer. Um, we also do things like um, engage them in our research groups, as Horia mentioned, um, but we get students to write papers as well. I mean, Danny, as she was finishing off her undergrad, wrote a paper with me. Uh, you know, so we try in as much as we can, you know, to not just teach you the way the world is now, but through our research, show you the way that the world might be when you graduate. And I think that's incredibly important. You know, we, we want our students going out into the world 
um, being immediately able to contribute. Um, so, Danny, what, what do you think makes the world different? What makes the world different makes the University <laughs> of Lincoln different? I think, as you said, Chris, it is the opportunities for student voice in every kind of level, whether it's like adding parts of the course, improving like the social side of it. It's like we have the two uh, societies, the games computing and the games development course. Did I say the same thing? <laughs> the game, I think you mean the, the games development society <laughs> and the computer science society. Yeah. yeah, that's what I meant. And how they are a great way to connect and kind of improve the community and the social side of it, as well as that like, you can make friends and talk to, work with lecturers on projects within the hackathons and gamathons if you wanted to, as well as work with friends. So I think it's all the social side and the connectivity side that Lincoln that makes it so unique and so and just connecting all different levels, whether it's through students, through academics, through higher ups. So it's all just a very friendly bunch of people. And I think the student societies as well. That's a really important point to mention. I mean, we are a big school. We have roughly 850 students across three years. And then we have NCOMP, masters and PhD students like Danny. It's worth saying as well, Danny actually was our school rep last year when she was the undergraduate too. Yes. Um, but those societies, you know, you can capitalise on the experience and the expertise of your peers. Um, and there's so much knowledge in that space. And let's be honest, we all struggle sometimes, right? You know, there, there are modules that we find harder. I mean, even now as a, as a doctor of computer science, there is subjects that I find complicated. Now, those societies, which are part of our students' union, but, but kind of sit within the school, um, are a great place to go and get peer-led support. And it's just, it really is a fantastic way to work. And I was mentioning earlier, thinking with the research as well, and with Danny saying that we do, uh, we, we have lecturers come along to hackathons, game jams, things like that. All our teaching staff are research active. We're all doing research all the time. And you have the opportunity to capitalize on the experience of of a range of, you know, we, we really are investigating the, the entire breadth of computer science. I do stuff in, in virtual reality, for example. Horia is, um, d does uh, controlling computers with your mind. I mean, it's a fantastic, uh, uh, maybe we'll have a chance to talk about that in a second. And Danny's a PhD student, is starting to lead her own research into, um, it's actually, I mean, it's really relevant because we're talking about helping students transition using video games. And it's, yep. it's just fantastic. Um, so, now we've kind of covered a bit about what makes SOX different. I think we, we kind of hit on something relatively interesting there. And I'd like to dig into that a little bit more. And, and that was the transition from A-levels to university. And I think this is something a lot of people worry about because they are, well, A-levels, B-techs, college, sixth form, regardless of what your kind of further education pathway is, or if you're a mature student coming in from industry, there is a jump. It's, it's, a, it's a very different kind of learning environment. And again, I'll pass this around my colleagues again in a second. But for me, the, the, the big change and the, the, the kind of impact that you'll see is a lot more freedom and a lot more ownership over your learning. Um, we like students to be the arbiters of their own success. We would like you to see you take control, take uh, charge of your learning. And we try and give space within the modules for you to, to specialize, for you to find something that you're really interested in and kind of all of that rabbit hole around to uh, around to Wonderland, you know, we, we try and give you some some space to do that. And one of the things that we we really try and get people to do is build up a portfolio while they're with us, um, of not just your experience, but but thing through the modules, but things that you developed in your own time. Like Horry said, working with a researcher, um, maybe working on an extracurricular project, a Euros, a students produce a project, um, and for me, that is the big difference between further education and HE, but it's been a while since I've done it. So I'm going to pass to Danny because um, you, you did your, your further education a bit more recently than I did. <laughs> what would you say the big, the big changes? I think, as you said, it's the, the more opportunities for independent learning and you, you go around and you read around your subject and you work, you work on your own kind of self-motivational skills. You really do have to be a, a self-motivated student at Lincoln. Um, but I think the main doesn't, difference for me was um the way in which lecturers kind of treat you it's more you're more adults now and you work um i especially found this with our dis my dissertation chris and you were my supervisor 
and it was more like we were colleagues kind of working towards us the like a similar goal like you, you supervised me you gave me helpful tips but we were working towards that like final goal that kind of dissertation that project and we, and we try and build that in you through the three years you know we don't just say right okay now you're here <laughs> go off and independent be an independent learner right that's not quite how you try and build those kind of independent mm. learning skills but i like to say you know I mean, Danny brings up her dissertation there, which you know, I was really fortunate to be involved in that project as a supervisor. <laughs> it was great fun, right? And I like to think by the time we get to dissertations, you know, rather than kind of being the captain of your ship, I, I want to be the person holding the map and kind of, you know, showing you where, you know, potentially that the hazards are, but really getting you to drive that project forward. And in that case, I mean, Danny absolutely did. And, and you won a prize as well, didn't you? You won the, the BCS prize for the, the region or something. I don't know. Yeah, I did. Yeah. <laughs> it, that, it was just, was... yeah. It shows you what, how good Lincoln is at developing you as an independent learner and a self kid learner to be able to create a project such as what I did and be able to get a prize out of it as well. Horry, do you have how... anything to add on that? Yeah, I mean, congratulations, uh, Danny. I didn't even know uh, <laughs> you were. Uh... <laughs> Finally, I can go through the stream today. <laughs> this computing society award is something that you know uh, it's really, really, really good, uh, and well done for doing that. Yeah, Chris, I, I really wanted to 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 touch more on the the portfolio building thing. Um, it, it seems like we're we're really creating a lot of opportunities for our students to to do this extracurricular activity to to get those certifications that they want uh, to to take part in perhaps a programming contest or problem solving contest or a hackathon so so um, even the work of student engagement officers and and digital learning uh, we 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 do a wonderful job with the students rep to really listen to our students and student needs and try and accommodate for as many opportunities uh, for them to boost their CV, boost their portfolio, and showcase this work to the world. Uh, just just yesterday, actually, uh, or the day before, we had we had a student showcase uh, mini conference where where we are. Right? It, it, it was unbelievable. We I was honestly so surprised by the projects that were presented there by our students, who who were doing these projects in their spare time. Mm. Uh, 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 fantastic, you know, projects that that are not yet on the market, uh, you know. Uh, so, 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 I really, I was really fascinated. I really think we just need to 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 give a platform for our students to to express uh, uh, their skills and show show to the world uh, th their fantastic work. And I think that's something I want to touch on because we've actually just had um, what we call our enhancement week, and with Hori talking about the. Aurea, uh, so talking about the uh, student showcase, but it's really cool to, to talk about the enhancement. This is something new that we've done this year. Um, we've broken the year up, well, broken the semester up into blocks of four weeks. And between each block, we've got a week long enhancement week. And that enhancement week is all about guest lectures, um, extra workshops, learning new languages, doing things to enhance your CV and, and you know, learning for the joy of learning not just learning to pass the module doing things that um really excite you about computer science you know because we we're doing this because we we love computers right we love making things that are digital and this enhancement week has been two things it's been giving people a chance to um uh catch, you to catch up on a bit of work do a bit of assignment work but also to engage with it. and we had this student led showcase as well so it's been a really fantastic time. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the shoot and showcase was literally just a... Um, it was a series of lectures led by students. And we had everything, students talking about how to write anti-cheat software, which was just mind-blowing, um, all the way through to open-source projects that people are building themselves and releasing out into the market. Absolutely fantastic. Mm. Now, transition, as we've just been talking about A-levels... Um, I want to cover transition a little bit um, and how we support people moving into the university. Now, Horia, you did a lot of the planning this year for our for our welcome week, our induction week. That's um, right. I wonder if you want to just chat a little bit about that. 
Yeah, I mean, I think uh, a lot of the universities kind of uh, face some challenges at the beginning of the semester. You know, how, how do we engage our students? How do you make sure that, that our students will get, uh, you know, to know other students, work with other students in the, you know, current restrictions? So, so we work really hard to try and, and create online uh, social activities uh, at the start to kind of, you know, get to know some uh, other students that perhaps are starting at the same time with you or perhaps know some some existing students and, and have, have some sort of mini mentors within the course uh, or, or even, you know, friends. Uh, this really helps uh, sometimes. Uh, we all know how difficult it is to be alone sometimes. So we really wanted this not to happen. Uh, and, and, and we run a series of uh, five activities, I think, in the first uh, welcoming week. Um, we, had, we had an online escape room where, where people worked in groups. Uh, some some students had uh, had friends already, so they worked in their own group, and some other students uh, worked with completely new students. And we, and we did everything from kind of like escape rooms, online escape rooms, to uh, we do um, a, a video games live stream. We do a Twitch stream fairly regular, and we did that as an induction event, and we showed you how to use the kit and, and introduce you to your personal tutor. And we also do peer mentoring as well. Hmm. Now, I've actually just seen um, in the comments that there's a question coming from... Um, Paulina. So is there a foundation yet? No, we don't do a foundation yet in the School of Computer Science. But if you're worried about meeting the entry requirements, we do have other routes in. So we have what's called a Cert HE route, um, which if you if you don't quite meet the um, uh, the entry requirements, you can apply via Cert HE. Um, and what we do is as you arrive, we provision slightly different support just to make sure that you are are brought up to speed. And at the end of that first year, which you will share with all the other first year students in the BSc, um, you can transfer then onto the BSc in your second year. Um, and actually, the, the Cert HE students do absolutely fantastically. I think because our course is structured in such a way that we have um, the first year is, is largely around building foundational skills anyway. And everybody needs those, regardless of where you are in your programming experience. Um, we find our Cert HE students do exceptionally well without the need for a foundation year in computer science. Um, and uh, Millie's just posted up, what societies are available that are computing related? Um, so, right, okay, so Danny's already mentioned two of them. So we have the Games Development Society and the Computer Science Society. But there are loads of others. So we have, oh, I'm trying to remember now, um, the Esports Society is one. And I... Basically, the, the joy of RSU is if you have an interest, you can actually set up a side to yourself. So if you have a very specific, if you want to set up the the Animal Crossing Society, right? I yeah. mean, Dan, Danny will be the first people person to join, right? Um, yeah. But, but there, you, if you have a specific interest in computer science, you can set that up. We also have groups within the Computer Science Society and Games Development Society. We have a bunch of people who are really just interested in cyber, and they get together to do cyber stuff. I mean, everything from kind of lockpicking all the way up to pen testing. So there's groups there. Um, and Camille says, um, are there any study abroad opportunities for computer science? Um, yes, Absolutely. If you want to, so right, we have loads of different opportunities to do study abroad. Um, too many, actually, that I, I think I can really do justice to in the space of this talk. You can actually do a year out, um, and we can, if a course matches our program, you can go away, you can study there and, and basically leave for a year and, you know, say leave in your second year, come back in our third year. We also just do study away. So you just take a like a placement year, a break in program go study at another university overseas and come back. Uh, we do placement opportunities, and we have had industry placements that have happened overseas. Last year, we had uh, one student who worked in Hong Kong for a year, for example. Um, and myself, with a, a few other colleagues, like um, our deputy um, program leader for computer science, we work with some other in, uh, universities overseas. Um, so in the second year projects this year, so we, you do a massive group project in the second year. It's a big kind of industry-led project. You can work with some students in Hong Kong. We're arranging opportunities to work with some students in Malaysia as well. Um, I think Danny knows some students who've actually been over to Malaysia and Hong Kong in the last year. 
like Jacob and, and so on who did the overseas yeah. placement. Um, Jed mentions for full time study, what is the time per week spent in uni or lectures? Um, I'm going to pass over to Danny in a second for this one. Um, the challenge we have with this question, right? Okay, so this is uh, this is a, actually a more tricky question than it sounds. One, your actual contact hours varies between the years, but the contact hours I believe are all available on the website. Um, however. Um, the way that a university is structured is you have 120 credits a year and each credit equates roughly to about 10 hours of study. Um, so some of those will be contact hours and some of those will be self-study times. And if you kind of divide that over the year, it works out as roughly 35 hours a week. Now, that's not just a standard at Lincoln. That's, that's a standard across the sector. So although you're coming in for your lectures, you should then be trying to stay on campus, work on your assignments, go to the library, read some books, um, obviously, that's not quite happening that same way at the moment. Um, but we have been doing things like provisioning library access. Now, Danny, you were always in our labs, um, especially during dissertation period. So you, you understand the kind of the, the, the drive to get that work done, right? Yeah, yeah. I think it does depend on what you wanted to work towards. So when a deadline would come up, you'd more likely be in the labs working towards that deadline and you could work in the labs with friends as well with the library you can book out group work group rooms to work uh, with your friends and like group members there so it the time per week does depend individually as a person how motivated you are i I was working in the labs pretty much every day because I had a group of friends that would. So we'd all just work together and kind of help one another within the labs. And, and it was it was a great way to talk to people because there were some times where I was like, oh, I, I couldn't understand this question from a workshop. And someone would come around and say, oh, I can help you with that. I know what to do. So, and they kind of guide you through that. And, and that peer support is really valuable. It's not, you know, it can't be underestimated. And the reality is if you're on campus so are we right so if yeah. you're on campus you can get capitalized from that support um and let's say for example i know horia was doing some research work with students and his reading group where they're getting together reading papers now that is kind of an extracurricular but that's leading directly into things like dissertations um so i'm going to move on question quickly um are there opportunities to work in industry this is a question from ellen taylor um Absolutely. You can absolutely do work with industry. We really encourage it. Um, so one of the things that we do do, and I'll, I'll pass Hori on this in a second, um, we do make the opportunity for a sandwich year available to you. So a sandwich year means you take a break at the end of year two, you go away, work in industry for a year, and then you rejoin us in third year. Now, those students who do that see massive benefits. Most of them come back to university having a job lined up, ready for when they go out into the industry. So that that's a, in my mind a big enough benefit as it is. You kind of um, you you've jumped the queue in the graduate recruitment kind of uh, area, but also those students generally see a, a a massive improvement in their grades. So people leave doing two ones and often come back achieving firsts because it it changes your perspective and anything you can do to learn more is valuable, you know. And you will learn so much in industry. Now, we don't set up those placements for you, um, but we have dedicated officers. We have a guy called Sam Cave, who's our college placements officer. And Daddy's smiling because Sam Cave is awesome, isn't he? He's, he's a, yeah. absolutely fantastic. Um, and he will help you get prepared. We have a career service who man, man a station uh, nine till five every single day. You can go in there and get help writing a CV, practices for a, um, an interview. And actually, one of the things that we do is on our second year module, we actually have an assignment, which is a mock interview. You apply for a job, submit a CV, and we interview you. And it is an absolutely fantastic... It's, it sounds like a, one of a weird assignment, but it's absolutely fantastic. Um, and there's so many students. It's one. I genuinely believe it's one of the reasons why our employment rates coming out of university are so high. And again, don't take my word for that. Look at the statistics. They're all officially published. University of Lincoln has fantastic graduate recruitment. Now, Horry, you did some interviews last year. Um, yeah, how well, did you find it? 
I, I mean, it was just fantastic. I didn't know we have this, but the feedback from the students was fun. It's worth saying Horry had joined us a year ago, so I think yeah. the interviews were a surprise, weren't they? <laughs> well, it was one of my first activities to join, so 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 I was very happy to to be part of the interviewer teams, uh, which which really is just just your lecturers and who try to help you actually get a job and help you prepare better to get a job. Uh, I have not seen this before anywhere else. Uh, but I highly appreciate this. Moreover, if I can add to, to the, uh, the industry-related uh, projects uh, question, uh, th th there's opportunities for internships, so you don't necessarily mm. need to take a whole year out. Uh, and we, uh, Summer projects as well, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, we've got the Uveros project where we, we kind of uh, propose research projects that students work on, so not necessarily industry-oriented, but maybe. Uh, but also we have current partners that we work with on different projects, uh, on different research problems. Uh, and even now, I have a couple of undergraduate students who, who actively have an industry project or re industry related project uh, for their dissertations. So 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 this can happen either you, you can take a, a year out and, and, and have this fantastic one year experience, or you can you can fill this gap as well um, uh, using other opportunities throughout summer uh, in your dissertation, etc. Um, so Millie in the in the comments says, "What sort of companies are the work placements with?" Mm. Um, right, whatever you fancy. Um, we've had a student who spent um, a year flying backwards and forwards over the channel, um, writing software code for for survey aircraft. We had a student who works with um, a company that does logistics and and uh, diggers and and does a lot of um, kind of groundwork stuff. And he was writing GPS code for them. Uh, we had a student who worked in Hong Kong. We've had a student go off very recently, come back from a AAA uh, game studio, and they worked on live code that was released during their placement. They worked actually fully on a, a AAA game, building um, the current big boss basically i don't think i'm not i don't know if i'm allowed to say where but it's a game i play a lot so if you ever watch my twitch streams you'll figure out what it is um so yeah literally everybody uses computers right i mean you know tech is all around us to to paraphrase um wet, wet, wet. <laughs> um and so yeah if you want to do a placement you just need to go and find that placement opportunity but we have a team who will help you find those um, Jed says, are we allowed to bring our own comp computers in to do our lectures and work? Absolutely. Now, in normal kind of um, non-pandemic world, in our labs, we have a whole bunch of um, bring-your-own-device stations, which are stations basically with a keyboard, a monitor, but you can bring your own computer in, hook it up. Um, we actively encourage students to bring their own computers because it is your environment that you will carry around with you. Our computers are fantastic. It's, it's something I'm really proud about. And, um, and Danny's smiling because she knows how much I wax lyrical about how cool our computers are. <laughs> we have full-spec gaming PCs in every single one of our labs. We're one of the few computer science universities that do that, and we're really proud of it. But if you're regularly working on a project and you want to set up your ID, your development environment up just the way you like it, you want the text a certain size, you want the background color... Uh, I don't know. I have one student who likes it to do screen shape when he types. Um, then you can set that on your machine and you can take it around. And it's always going to be there. It's always going to be available. So, no, we absolutely encourage that. And especially now, again, pandemic world, having your own device has been really, really, really useful. So, no, absolutely encourage it. Um, Alfie says, how is computer science assessed? What is the split between assignments and exams? I couldn't give you the precise split off the top of my head. Um, one thing I would say is computer science is a practical subject, and the vast majority of our modules are assessed um, through elements of coursework. So um, anywhere from submitting code to essays to videos to presentations. We don't do many written exams, just down to the nature of the subject. Um, that being said, we, we see progression between the three years. So the first year, you're about learning knowledge. You're about kind of absorbing information. And an exam is quite a good way to assess that. In the second year, we're doing a lot more um, synthesis. You're building a lot more stuff. You know, you're making networks. You're, you're creating code. You're doing a group project. 
and at that point we start doing a lot more like more practical level stuff and i i you know it's the split is definitely biased towards assignments i mean danny you've been through it so um would you confirm on that <laughs> yeah i would say it is mainly coursework assessed with a few like sprinklings of like in class tests it's like in the first year I don't know what well, in-class tests kind of change. Some are multiple choice. Some are you write the answers in and they are a good way to assess. And then there's like, you have the end of year exams kind of, well, end of term exams, should I say. Um, but they're not huge essay based questions. They're like smaller technical questions and, and they are kind of focused on the theory of computer science or theory of that module. Um, and then they, with the coursework, uh, they're a great way to assess um, how you're learning and how what you've learned in apply. That's what am I trying to say? What you've learned and to apply that within a pra more practical based environment. And that's, I mean, like the group projects and things like that. You know, you are actually working as a software development team. Now we've actually hit the end of the session, but um, assume it's all right with my colleagues. Uh, I, we're going to overrun a little bit because I think answering those questions is really important. Um, but there's a couple of the bits that I think you might want to know about computer science and games computing at Lincoln. Um, so I'm just going to say one thing really, really quickly. There, there is tends to be a little bit compute, confusion around the games computing degree and how that differs from computer science. Both are computer science degrees. At the core of it, if you are a games computing student, we want you to be an excellent computer scientist, first and foremost. Um, and you will do a lot of similar modules. You have the same kind of core Right, you have the same core understanding, um, but whereas computer science might demonstrate a network via, um, built, I don't know, building a some sort of network system, we might make games. Computer might make a multiplayer game. Right at the core of it, you are still a solid computer science, and I think it's the credit of the games computing program that a lot of our games graduates choose not to go to get into the games industry. They find other careers that interest them just equally, and they go off. Health. End up with a lot of games computing students working the, the finance industry for some reason. Um, uh, GPUs, I mean, uh, or simulation, we get quite a lot of that gone off into simulation roles because they understand that area. Now, Hori, you teach on both programs. So you teach um, on games computing and computer science. And would you confirm on that? Yeah, I mean, I think. <clears throat> I think um, I, I can fully confirm this. Uh, we've 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 all got a, a strong a base knowledge, uh, as you said, Chris. Uh, but I think it's it it only depends on on on, on the the student goal. Where do they actually want to uh, work at the end of the day? And, and if if some students are very passionate about building games and playful experiences, uh, and they might want to 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 then uh, decide to to take the game computing uh, uh, curricula. Um, that's totally fine. If somebody is more passionate about uh, uh, how they can uh, perhaps analyze data better and and, and move into uh, perhaps a, a data like a more traditional role, I suppose, yeah. Or yeah, that's that's right. Then then perhaps a more computer science or general computer science uh, curricula will will benefit best. Uh, so so it's really I mean, Danny's probably the the good example of this. Actually, I've just thought about this because yeah. you're a computer you were a computer science student who did a game for her dissertation and now you're doing a games-based phd right yeah i think it was the optional modules in third year that kind of helped with that i did vr as my optional module i kind of that kind of piqued my interest and i was able to apply what i already knew from learning in computer science to the vr module and then that became my dissertation as well and now it's become my phd so i've kind of moved from computer science to more games computing but I didn't have to learn anything I mean there are a few things I had to learn but I could apply all what I learned and my knowledge into that kind of different environment so it's it's and, they're very much intermingled yeah no completely and so and this is interesting actually because Camille um in the in the comments has said which programming languages do you cover in the first year now one of the reasons I so I, I I like to cover this question in a talk anyway. We tend to teach through um, a range of languages, largely C sharp, Python, uh, C plus plus at the moment. Um, but this is one of the big reasons, and I normally cover this in the difference between kind of further education and, and higher education. 
we try to teach you not to look at the language per se. We teach you how to program. We teach you how to understand how code works together. We teach you logic. Once you understand those programming fundamentals, you can apply them to any language. I mean, language is really just a set of syntax. Um, and you can go learn that syntax yourself. You know, there, there's. Um, I would expect one of my third year students, um, and Danny's a recently graduated third year student, I would expect to be able to say one of my third years, if you want to do your dissertation on this subject, right, okay, well, you're going to have to program this in Java. And I would expect that third year student to go, right, okay, give me a day, I'm going to go away, I'm going to learn the syntax, and I'll come back to you tomorrow. And that's the level I expect my third years to get to. Um, and I think that first year curriculum, I talked about that foundational curriculum is so important for that. And that, Danny, you've been through that process. Uh, wait, well, we, I just zoned out for a second there, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we talk about the foundational programming. Yeah. So I think because I did computer science and the, you do really are taught how to program and how the programming concepts and you'll be able to pick up another language. So you're taught the concepts in first year and then in second year you're learning different languages, but you're able to pick them up really quickly because of the foundation and the ability to learn and adapt to different coding um, languages. And then in my third year and using a different uh, gaming languages, I was able to adapt again and kind of build on those adaptive skills and those like fundamental programming skills that you can apply anywhere and to any different language. Because, so, yeah. I mean, this is one of the important things that we talked about the industry as well. You mm -hmm. know, at the moment, we know what the trendy languages in industry are. Right, we can see that, and they're different to what the trendy languages were three years ago, right? And this is why we need to make adaptable students, students that can throw themselves at problems. We want problem-solving programmers, you know, computer scientists, rather than somebody who says, "I know a bit of C," right? So, because what might be the trendy language next year might not be one we teach, and that's fine because I'm absolutely confident my students would be able to adapt and still thrive in that environment. Um, so one of the last things I want to, to kind of pick up on is, is how we take care of our students in SOX. And um, it's a nice one to end on. And unless there are any other questions, we'll, we'll, we'll call it a day at that. We have a number of structures built into the school to take care of you. Um, so kind of at the high level, so I'm, I'm the director of teaching and learning. My job is literally to look at all our undergraduate programs and our postgraduate programs and make sure they are healthy, they are current with industry, and that the students are getting the very best experience that we can provide within the school. Horia is, is our, our student engagement lead. So Horia is there looking at how he can bring students into more projects, how, um, how we can enhance the student experience, how we can make more activities, how we can help you build your portfolios. We have direct. We have um, digital education leads. We have program leads. The program leads look at our individual courses and maintain the health of that individual program. But on the ground level, you have things like personal tutors. Now, your personal tutor is somebody you'll have throughout your three years. You'll you'll be allocated to a personal tutor in first year, and they were there to look after your kind of pastoral health, so your mental, your social well being. If you've got any um, problems with your, your academic engagement, your personal tutor is absolutely going to be there to help you. Now, me and Hori are both personal tutors. We both have our own students. Um, Danny's been through the, the, the personal tutoring process. Um, all I can say is that these, um, these PTs are really there to be your advocates, to really help you, and you can pull on that resource as much as you like. The other side of this as well, and we've been talking a lot about peer support, and I think you know if I was to summarize the, the discussion that we've had today i think that peer support has been a major theme um but you have peer mentors in first year now horia along with one of my colleagues olivier um is involved in the peer mentoring process and uh danny i think you were a peer mentor at one point were you i think i was for a little bit of the time <laughs> i had to hop yeah. in and out being a, i was a school rep as well so and that will i'll come to the reps as well because that's another thing yeah. And the peer mentors, there's loads of questions you may want to ask that you may not want to ask an academic, like um, where is the best place to buy a sandwich? Um, you know, um, 
you know, where should I do my shopping? How do, where do I how do I find the laundrette? Right now, we'll do our best. If you ask us these questions, we'll do our best to answer you. But there are some things. Where's the who has the best nightclub night on a Wednesday? Right. This, this I haven't got a clue, and I don't think Horry. Well, Horry's a bit trendier than I am, so maybe he knows where the best nightclubs are. Um, but um, the your peer mentor can really help you with that. They are there to, literally to help you transition in. They're there to support you. Um, and you'll have that peer mentor all the way through your first year. And when you get to the end, you can apply to be a peer mentor yourself. Um, so the last one I want to bring up is the school reps. Um, because you, the reps are system runs for the SU. Horry works very closely with the reps. Horry is our kind of rep liaison from, from the staff side. But Danny has a really unique experience on reps because she was a school rep. Um, so Danny, can you just give us an idea of what the reps do? Okay, so each year has their own kind of course rep in which supports that year. So if you're on a games computer course or a computer science course, you'll have two reps that will support you in each year and they will change yearly depending if you want to be it yourself. So you have ample opportunity to be one. Um, and then there's the school rep, which looks after all of the little course reps and kind of supports the school as a whole and will listen to feedback and talk back to the student engagement lead and any other um and yes it's like a two-way liaison as well right yeah so you listen to feedback you you tell the student engagement lead and the su and then they'll feedback whatever improvements they want to do and um you know changes and then you'll talk back to the students it's about helping build that student voice right it's helping but not just just kind of because I mean, there's times that students want to feedback on what we're doing, things that we're doing well, things they'd yeah. like to see different. Like, but also sometimes um, it's translating the message down, isn't it? Yeah, mm. there was an example. It's like every in my year, people enjoyed enjoyed using the poll system to learn more within their lectures, and a lot of people enjoyed that. So they set feed feedback that to me, saying, "Oh, we want more of that." And I was able to tell Chris at the time that, and it was able to work more in lectures and. And a lot of people enjoyed that. And I was able to talk back to students saying, yeah, this is going to happen. We heard you. This is going to happen. It's going to change. So, yeah, it was, it was a really good way for positive feedback too. Right. On, on that note, um, I'm going to suggest that we call it a day there. Um, so uh, absolutely fantastic. Thank you for everyone for um, um, uh for, for joining in getting involved in the question actually i've just seen one last question now we'll just answer this one then we'll move then we'll we, we can go get some lunch um so millie smith says my sister did an interview for the university of microsoft um is it common for students to be involved in things like that yes we've had loads of students who so again during the enhancement week we've had industry guests coming in um we've had students who have got jobs during quarantine um it's it's a different environment right and we're all trying to kind of find our way around it we we're hoping that by you know that we, we want to kind of get back to full face-to-face -face activities as soon as we can as soon as it's safe to do so um but we've adapted what we've done to try and make that more accessible one of the things that we did for example uh, during the enhancement we had a panel with employers um, and students could go in there and ask questions and and engage on that way. So yes, Millie, absolutely, um, we we're doing as much as we can, and I think it's been going really well. Uh, the feedback we've been having from the students has been fantastic this year, and again, a lot of that feedback has been driven by stuff. Now, Danny was the school rep last year. That feedback came through the process, and we've made changes this year based on that. Um, we've tried to do things as best as we can just to enhance the program. You know, it's it's it has worked really well. Um, so yeah, on, on that note, uh, we'll call it a day at that. Obviously, if you've got any questions at all, um, my colleagues in the chat are going to post up a link to Unibuddy. Um, so uh, if you go to Unibuddy, you will talk to the absolutely fantastic Danny herself. She'll be uh, manning, the, manning the stations. Yeah. Um, but uh, by all means, if you've got any questions, reach out to the school. Uh, we're absolutely fantastic to hear from you. And hopefully we'll, we'll see you on campus uh, next year. So... Um, I'll pass around. It's just bye from me, Horia. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, Danny, for for the wonderful um, presentations. And yeah, yeah. See so you, thank Danny. You.
everyone. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Right.